This podcast contains discussions on sexual misconduct. Topics such as sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment may be discussed. Listener discretion is advised, and we encourage self-care and seeking professional support as needed. Just in some settings, just mentioning the word sex can put you on on a blacklist or can make people, uh, you know, community leaders and community members take a, a specific position towards you. Ibrahim Abu Khalil is WHO's full-time prevention and response to sexual misconduct technical officer, now based in Yemen. He shares his experience on the field in conservative settings and highlights the power of awareness raising as a solution to address vulnerabilities. The more we start actually promoting and doing some awareness campaigns, then you can see the vulnerability actually it, it starts decreasing little by little. And then you can see people are more empowered to make informed decisions because now they do have access to the information. Ibrahim advocates inviting men to be part of the collective responsibility and action in creating a culture of inclusivity. Men, you are equally responsible actually of making our work environment really respectful. If you don't know how to do it, you have all the uh, in place, you have everything that has been put at your service in order to know exactly what, what should be done. This is the Hashtag No Excuse podcast. We discuss the challenges, complexities, and potential solution in preventing and responding to sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment in the humanitarian and development sectors. You'll hear interviews with victims and survivors, experts, aid workers, artists, and leaders. The podcast is produced by the World Health Organization's Department for the Prevention and Response to Sexual Misconduct. I am Guni Dias, your host and Global PRS Network Coordinator for the department. Ibrahim, you've worked in high-risk countries, Libya, Liberia, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and now Yemen. These are countries where the word sex can be a taboo. What has been your experience in the field when trying to prevent and respond to sexual misconduct where WHO is operating? It's not an easy thing, to be totally honest with you. Uh, I mean, just in some settings, just mentioning the word sex can put you on on a blacklist or can make people, uh, you know, community leaders and community members take a, a specific position towards you and what you're trying to bring into the table, you know, if leading an emergency uh, project or like a development and and so on. At the first intervention, at the first reaction or interaction with the local communities, I actually tend to remove remove the word like sex from the, Mm. even though if it's it's, it's part of my title. So what we need to approach is that once uh, you establish some kind of like trust, with the local communities, I mean, with members of the local communities, like recently, for example, and this is something a lesson lesson learned, we had trainings to over 100 people from, uh, you know, healthcare workers that came from specific areas in Yemen. And they, I mean, sex is considered, I mean, even mentioning the word, you cannot do it. Mm. And then we removed everything from the presentation that is related to sex and so on, until we actually start sitting, sitting with the group and having conversation and so on. And then, I mean, within one hour, we we managed to establish this kind of like trust exchange and so on. And they helped us actually in in paving the way in order to use uh, the word. uh, And they were using it and males and females. And it was really interesting to have in some sessions to have men uh, coming out and talking about this in front of women, which, which is not usually part of the cultural interaction there and so on. But even also having women stand up and talking about this. So I think the key thing here is that how you build trust and how you build the rapport with the with the uh, people that you are working with and you are working for. And I think one of the key things is that do not come with pre-existing, you know, kind of like, um, this is the way, this is the approach we're going to adopt in order to implement this. You know, it doesn't work that, that way. And I think the more we open our ears and eyes and listen to the people we are working with, they can help us a lot in actually navigating 
you know the barriers the social barriers the 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 social misconception about the word itself i can only imagine in your context as a man you know doing this work how are you received and is it something that is difficult and i wonder is it maybe better to be a woman to do this work in your in your context it's not easy you know uh, basically because um, i mean this area of work is i mean like gender based violence like protection is dominant by female colleagues you know within this area and to have a man actually trying to navigate and try to get into it it's it's not an easy thing i mean because usually um it's it's a conversation that really happens from the perspective of women because there is also a kind of like an understanding that it's really out there about like you know victims and survivors are mostly are you know all the time women which is to a certain extent it's 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 not true there are some some victims and survivors that are not women and so on now to go back to the issue of the question yes definitely i am perceived i mean the first thing is that i i see the eyebrows they go up and it doesn't make my um, my position easier actually to to respond to this but once we we engage in the conversation and they start seeing the perspective the the different i mean the other side of the conversation and i think we we need to more mobilize you know on uh, on the, on the male aspect of uh, of the spectrum is to have them more engaged in order to to see also from their perspective what can be done i mean if we, most of the perpetrators are men and i think we need to engage with them in order to reduce that especially with youngest generation and so on has it ever been an advantage actually to be a man do you have like a story where it was an advantage for you to be a man talking about this subject approaching this you know especially when it comes to authorities like one of the the key challenges that we face in Yemen is that two thirds of the country is under the de facto government and they do have a kind of like a, a council that manages everything that's related to security mm-hmm. and protection is part of that and when we say protection protection it means everything related to gender based violence uh, sia and so on and so forth so prch falls under that umbrella that this council is really managing and most of these people not mo- most all of them are men so it's good actually to have that perspective it becomes really an advantage i mean to having a man speaking to a man about things that can occur which can hamper the actually delivery of services i mean the relationship between the communities the reputation of the organization even the authorities and also it took us i mean 8 weeks at least to to convince them actually that these these trainings are essential mm. and when we started having the sessions conducted they started looking at it that there is no nothing that's really sexual about it you know i mean the even the title is really there we're talking about unacceptable behavior that could be done or could occur from anybody the second thing is that conducting awareness and and trainings that are bilateral you know with smaller groups and we start at the bottom of the pyramid you know we start with janitors we start with and most of these uh, professions are uh, male dominant so if we start with those and they feel that they, they are included and i heard it actually from a fleet manager and who told me that often we feel neglected and nobody considers us whenever there is an awareness raising session or a training or whatsoever we don't feel involved as if we are not part of the office structure or the organization and so on so having this bilateral conversation with people you know in small groups it will give us the space and the opportunity to listen to their ideas to have them Uh, have a sense of ownership you know in terms of what's really going on and they are the main contributors to having a respectful workplace and, and environment given your background in mental health i was wondering when you're on the field how does that help you in your work in raising awareness on the prevention to sexual misconduct when we talk about mental health and psychosocial support we don't talk about the health aspect of it we talk about the protection aspect of it we talk about the education aspect of it we go we talk about all the components that people who are affected by a crisis or by a conflict they might need and we start at the bottom of the pyramid again we start with the i mean if i i'm, I'm a mental health professional for example 
And I see people coming with distress, you know, distress. Instead of giving medication or consultation or whatsoever, the basic question will, will I, will I will ask is that, do you have a home to stay in? Do you have a shelter, you know, adequate shelter for you and your family? Do you have food enough on your table? Do you have access to health services and education and, and so on? If people have all of this and they still uh, suffer, I ask them about the other question, which is related to the family and community support. Do you see your family on a regular basis? Do you engage in social activities, you know, with the, with your peers and so on? And and so and this is really essential in terms of doing so and protection. And believe me, the more we emphasize, we put some em- emphasis on this issue, the more the less people will become vulnerable to to being exploited or abused or or whatever uh, harassment because some some of the people who uh, who work with us as as aid workers actually they come from these communities and if they are vulnerable and they see the vulnerability of others sometimes they they can take advantage but with awareness raising with with education you know with uh, capacity building we can these things can be addressed and, and so on so being a mental health you know and having a mental health you know and being clinical psychologist as well it helps me to the way i i look at the um, at the needs assessing them and how we can work together with the person who is uh, in front of us actually based on of course i tell them about the information that is really available and so on and believe me one of the key things when i worked in mosul uh, during the military operations and so on is that most of the people who were vulnerable they did not have access to, to services due to one key thing is the uh, due to lack of information so the services were available the people who uh, who were in need they were there but they didn't know about the available services within their their area and that made them really vulnerable you know to being exploited to being harassed to being whatever you want to call it in, in that sense and the more we start actually promoting and doing some you know awareness campaigns about like the available service, and this is where we started and then you can see the vulnerability actually it, it start decreasing little by little and then you can see people are more empowered to make informed decision because now they do have access to the information what is something that makes you feel hopeful about the prevention and response to sexual misconduct i mean it took us a long time as as a international organization or un un agencies in order to admit actually that these things are really happening and and despite the uh, i mean all the initiatives that were taking ever since um, beginning of the century to 2002 and so on but i think what's really hopeful now is i see the drive i mean that's going through within who but within the un system within ingos as well is that and it's really motivating it's really inspirational you know i can see how people are really involved and and you can look at the people <laughs> when I, w- i was meeting with my counterparts from unicef unicr and also the rchc office you can hear actually the motivation you can hear the energy the, the the in their voices i mean when we're talking discussing about like what what can we be done and so on and that gives me a lot of hope i mean in terms of what where we are going and how we're going to combat this and and so on of course we're we're going to try to as much as we can and this is what makes me also hopeful that it should be an integrated part of any workplace of any working environment we need to integrate it with our day to day performance you know behavior attitudes uh, knowledge conversations and that gives me also the inspiration and and also looking forward because you get engaged with people and focus on what they can do and build on their knowledge already whether it's technical whether it's, it's human you know in terms of communication and i think this is a key message to be spreading and to give away and to keep repeating as well that you matter you know whatever you are whoever you are whatever your job is i mean whatever you're doing you're contributing into something really larger than than ourselves and whatever effort you will put in that sense it will help us actually become better and better Anything else you want to share or you want people to remember a message that you'd like to to leave the audience? Yeah, I would say to the men actually. Men, you are 
equally responsible actually of making our work environment really respectful you know and let's work together i mean if you if you don't know how to do it i mean you have all the uh, in place you have everything that has been put at your service in order to know exactly what what should be done so it's it's okay if you don't know what to do but it's not okay to to continue not knowing what to do because you have everything you have all the mechanism in place in order to help you and assist you in actually making our our work uh, environment more respectful and more engaging and more productive so this is this is my key message would be sent to everybody actually across the board who might be listening to this podcast thank you ibrahim thank you guni thank you so much for having me Thank you for listening to this episode of the World Health Organization's Hashtag No Excuse podcast. We hope we've given you another perspective on preventing and responding to sexual misconduct in the humanitarian and development sectors. We release new episodes every two weeks. But if you have any feedback, questions or suggestions in the meantime, feel free to reach out at prseah at who.int. Until the next time, goodbye.